All right, well, let's turn in our Bibles uh, to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Let me pray before we get started. Lord, I thank you for equipping me in such a way so as not to overlook the difficult passages. I thank you, Lord, that difficult passages and difficult concepts, biblically, continue to show your perfect righteousness. I thank you, Lord, that you have gifted us with a church with tremendous diversity. And it goes beyond the ethnicity and the race and the nationality. And I see, Father, just a unification of gifts under the same spirit. And so, Father, I ask um, of you, O Lord, that the hearts and the souls of individuals here today and the children, Lord, they begin to hear something maybe that they have not heard before. And for some, Lord, who've heard this before, that they hear it in a new way. We ask, O Lord, that the light of Christ would shine brightly upon the scriptures, allowing for us, Lord, to faithfully obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 through 12, as we continue in this series, God, Marriage, and Sexuality. We start part 3 today. And it says here, after the rebellious act in the garden, it says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from what? The presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he says, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, watch this accountability here, men. Because a few minutes ago, it was this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He says, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The title of my message, and it bears witness to what we are experiencing even now today. Man of God, where are you? Men, look at me. Man of God, where are you? are you. From the very beginning, we got to ask ourselves, what does this call at the very beginning indicate? Man, where are you? Did you notice the shift right there in the text? That it went from plural to singular, quickly. And there becomes this call to the men. More importantly, in this situation, man of God, where are you? Well, it indicates you aren't where you're supposed to be. Because now this rebellion against God has first created separation between God and man to where the fellowship is no longer enjoyed. The first thing that God begins to call out into the man is the sweet fellowship is missing. It's missing. But not only is the sweet fellowship missing, I gave you a role, 
and a responsibility. Man of God, where are you? What he's indicating by this call is that the man has the primary responsibility of the state of the union of marriage. He bears the primary responsibility. Now, for those who would argue, and there's a lot of arguments with this, I would ask, why then did it go from a plural to a singular when it came down to the accountability of the union of the marriage? He didn't say, where are both of you? He says, where are you? I grew up as the oldest in my family. When my mother left the house, so don't judge me here and don't judge my mama. But when my mama felt that I was old enough, she would leave the house and leave me with my younger brother, my younger sister. Now, for those who've heard my story, you know, I grew up in a very dysfunctional family from generation to generation. But there's something innate that I've never seen a family do, is that when the mama comes home and things are broken and things are out of place, my, mama, my mother never came home and talked to the youngest. She never came home, I got my baby sister, her name is Ashley. She never came home and said, Ashley, why did you allow this? Now, if she would have, I'd have been like, it's about time. <laughs> it's about time. No, we would think it to be irresponsible for a parent to come home and the youngest child bear the primary responsibility. We can all agree on that. But mama comes home, Myrna, and says, William. She, you know, she was my government name. <laughs> William, where were you when this happened? It's not that my brother and my sister were inferior. It was just that the headship, because I was the oldest, laid on my shoulders as the primary responsibility of my family when my mother was gone. How many of you are the oldest in here? Did you ask for it? <laughs> Interesting, huh? Didn't ask for it. Ladies, we didn't ask for the headship. We didn't ask for it. We were called. And I say that with humility because nothing qualifies dirt. We were made from the ground. So men, what qualified you as dirt? There was nothing special about you. Nothing special about me. There's nothing in the dirt that's different in regards to the essence with the woman. But what we see is that even before the institution was created, man was already subduing the earth. Man was already naming the animals. And he had been given the responsibility because of his headship, the responsibility of naming Eve twice, as woman and as Eve. Well, why is that important? That means that the fall did not distort the role. Because before the fall, he named her woman. After the fall, Eve, mother of all living. What I'm sharing with you is that before woman came on the scene, he was already, God had already called man, and man was not qualified. But God qualified him through the call. But I think there's something we overlook, Josh. Let's turn to Genesis 3.17, if you could just look down. 
I think there's something that we miss. Because when we get headship right, the responsibilities of a man become very, very, very clear. But there's something here in verse 17. You see how when God called, there was order in that call. Man went to the woman. But you see in the curse, it's reversed here in regards to how it is that God designates this curse. But there's something here in verse 17. And he says, and to Adam, he said, say it with me now, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Did you catch it? Because you obeyed the voice of your wife. That must have been some really bad advice. It was because in that moment, as the head, Adam, was the recipient of the command, the will of God. And in that moment, he removed himself from the headship as the primary bearer of the state of the union. He removed himself. And he, it's not that he listened to his wife, but he listened and obeyed. That usurped the authority. And now, as a man should have been guarding and not just gardening, it usurps the role. And then Adam has the nerve to say, it's the woman that you brought to me. The fall distorted the way we exercised headship, not the design of it, not a switch of gender roles now, but in the way that it is exercised is distorted. And I would go further and to say it's demonic in a lot of ways. Let's go to Ephesians 5. Verse 23, and I'm going to get there a little faster than you right now. Steve, this one isn't on the screen. That'll be for the next one. I see you, though. You're a step ahead. Here it is. Ephesians 5, 23. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, <clears throat> that doesn't mean, men, that you are a Marvel comic hero. You're not your wife's savior. Whew. Okay? But you look at the role that Christ was given. And the Bible says that there was no other name under heaven given to men by which we can be saved. That means there was a designated role, only Christ himself. It's very specific. And every time that you see headship in the Bible, it is never detached to where it is mutually exclusive to where we can make it, make it into whatever we want to. It's always connected to Christ. It's always connected to God. What we do in headship is we remove it and we say, well, this is the way I saw it being done in my home. And we start to become pharisaical, usurping the authority of the word of God for tradition. For tradition. 
But what we see here, we don't like the language. Ari, I saw you in the back. You know, sometimes we don't like that language of headship. And we don't like this language of for the husband is the head of the wife. Let's be honest. But this is where I will help in this area when we see these particular texts that cause the record to scratch. That means there is something culturally and there is something theologically that you just don't understand yet in what it meant to them then. Immediately we jump to what it means to us now. So the moment that you hear this language of the husband is the head of the wife, it's like stop right there. And we forget even as. It's a comparison, young men, a comparison. Not just headship that you get to create on your own. There is a comparison. And he says, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. See, what we really don't like in the Bible is uncomfortable language. Let's be honest. When we read about true discipleship and the cost of discipleship, do you remember what Jesus said to those who were following him? He said, you must hate your mother and your father. Eh, record scratch. That means, once again, there is something radical that is being shared, and you've got to know the meaning behind what he said. Or when he says, hey, I loved Jacob, but Esau, I what? Hated. Ooh, record scratch. And if we don't understand, there's something that he's getting across in a radical way. And in those particular instances is that I love more. Hate mother and father, I need you to love me more than everything. Now, for some of you, you'd be like, Jesus, just say that. <laughs> but what you're saying, Christ, I want you to be arrogant. Talk to the people of the day in a way that they don't understand. When we're asking scripture to say, you know what, bow down to us and make it plain. No, pursue, study, learn, search, seek. That's what an attitude of humility does. Arrogance says, I need you to say it this way to make me feel comfortable. I get it. Men have screwed up. Men, have we screwed up? Yes. yes. I'm going to say it again. Men, have we screwed up? Yes. yes. We've messed it up. And if you didn't want to answer, you got some things to deal with now. I don't think you guys heard me when I said my wife got to put up with me. Why am I saying this is because a lot of times people are afraid to touch this topic because they continue to keep headship in a traditional format as opposed to being rooted through how Christ loved the church. And so we could just make it into whatever we want to, based on my biases. I get it. The moment that you hear headship, immediately it's control. And it's abusive control. It's abusive authority, isn't it? For men who have taken this traditional approach, and I would say sinful, to dominate your wife is sinful. Sinful. To abuse, abuse your wife, sinful. Sinful. You know what control is? It's the absence of love. It's rooted in fear, insecurity, and pride. Headship. This is Pastor Will's best definition as we go through the scriptures. Headship is the called accountability, or the called accountable authority given to the husbands to the glory of God in their marriage. It's called accountability. 
So in the same way, the Bible uh, teaches about those in whom teach will be judged more strictly. Men, husbands. You know what's going to happen? He's going to say, where are you? Where were you? And if all you got to answer is to say, I was working from nine to five. I was, you know, we know the three P's, don't we, men? Protect, provide, and be the priest. Hmm. But not to the extent in which we neglect our families. That's what the prophet Elder Jimmy McDonald said. (laughs) Headship just means you're accountable to God for your family and how you exercise the authority. Do you notice I'm not using a certain word here or a certain phrase? I didn't say head of the household. I didn't say that. Head of the household is an economic expression. Head of the household simply means you, you earn 50% or more in the house. That's head of household. You do your taxes, I do mine. Head of household now. And it has to do with what you make. I'm not, let's not bring in these references that further confuse headship. Let's turn the Bibles to Romans 12. I hear God lead me in a a direction here. Romans 12. Everything, ever since Pastor Kevin had preached on this a little bit uh, a couple weeks ago, I've just been, I've been stuck here. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Uh, Why don't you just remember what I'm saying right now? Headship, not necessarily head of household in the way that we would think, but headship and how it is that we allow the culture to influence what we think about the headship. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2, I'm just going to read here from the screen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We're going to get to that here in a few minutes. But here it is that I'm locked in at. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, all right, testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. But it's do not be conformed to this world. To be conformed, as I've heard it said, is permissive passivity. That concept simply means that when you think about the exercising of headship or the understanding of headship, you don't even examine it. You allow for the culture to conform you to its view without examination. So what happens is from generation to generation, headship keeps being talked about, which is why when women hear submission to the husbands, it's like, I don't want none of that. Why? Because they keep seeing headship represented in a cultural way and not a Christ-centered one. So women have every right to go, when they hear that, if the headship has made it all about himself and the traditional values he wants to uphold because of what's been happening for generations. This is what's happening is that we are going about this husbandly role without examination to just pull back in humility, look in the mirror. And when I say the mirror, I'm talking about the word of God that gives freedom and to say, am I doing this thing right? Am I doing it right? What's going on? I didn't say run to your pastor. I didn't say go to a therapist and talk about how bad your wife is. I'm talking about going here. Am I doing it as you have done unto me? Or have I allowed the culture to create conformity to this headship that now the headship is disfigured and deformed? 
See, true headship leads with humility, fellas. Humility. It leads with reverent fear of God. It's not about domination. It's not about control. Headship is about building up, Jason, not breaking down. And we've been breaking down women, breaking them down. We need households of men, godly men, who are Christ-centered, who are willing not to conform to the pattern, but to say, hold on, I think my mind needs to be renewed. I need some transformation generationally. Or you will be warped by the ways of the world and find that three generations down, there's a husband, there's a man who's still doing what his daddy did and then what his daddy did. You know what headship is? And headship isn't, I'm your boss. That's not what it is. Headship is being called to the primary responsibility for your family. And ladies, it helps us out as we are submitting to God, that we are submitting together so that our marriage is a witness to the world that we love God so much that we're willing to die. Not that, oh, I just want to feel comfortable. You're willing to die, be renewed in your mind, transform, and to understand that, no, he doesn't want a man to dominate me. Why? Because he didn't. He didn't. So now that we understand the headship, I got eight minutes left. I want you to understand something. We just spent almost 25 minutes about the headship because if you get that wrong, it doesn't matter what you do now. Because it flows from the rootedness in creation of how God created the image of husband and wife and how they should engage one another to his glory. This isn't an exhaustive list. Believe me, I went through this list so many times. And I think what happens is that we read the Bible, and if we make it purely topical, we'll only go to certain verses that talk about marriage. But what is the truth? The whole Bible is about marriage. It's about how God lost his bride in the garden and how the husband is coming back to get his bride, the church. It's a love story like no other. Better than Star Wars. Better than Lord of the Rings. But now the question should be, Josh, how do we exercise our headship? How do we exercise our headship? And I would challenge us to look at it as a spiritual act of worship. Not as a duty. That's boss language. Spiritual act of worship. What is our responsibility? And I want you to hold this imagery. That we should hold his hand while you hold her heart. Hold his hand while you hold her heart heart. Because if I let go of the hand that's leading me, then I am leading my wife and pulling her along. You know how that looks. Any other husbands who are fast walkers? Okay, thank you. Okay. (laughs) When you see my wife and I, you always see my wife like 10 steps behind. I stride it out, baby. I stride that thing out. My wife, she, she here lollygagging. But for her, it's like, that's my tempo. You married me. That's what it's going to do. But think about this. The moment that I stop holding his hand and I start going here, now I'm grabbing her and saying, no, you must do and walk as I walk. I can never let go of his hand. If I let go of his hand, then I won't see death in a joyous way. I won't see life in a joyous way. All I'll be doing is idolizing happiness. That's what you'll do. And that's what some of us are doing right now. We're idolizing happiness. 
because you've let go of the hand and you've made it into something that you wanted. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. You guys still with me? I told myself I might go get up here and sweat because Nina going to talk about me. <laughs> you, guys don't, you, you guys do not understand. <laughs> Nina has went as far as getting me a special cloth. I use it from time to time when it's clean. She's always like, why are you up here sweating all the time? Josh don't sweat. Jimmy don't sweat. But you up here sweating all the time. She's like, you know what irks me? You always get to here. You need to get here. <laughs> <laughs> Nina, am I lying? No, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 here. Remember, hold him, hold his hand as you are holding the heart of your wife. Think about where Paul connects this to. Husbands, love your wives. As, everybody say as. as. Christ love the church. Now, what, look at this. Listen to this sanctified, poetic language. It's beautiful language. And I want to challenge every husband. Does it sound like domination? Does it sound like control? That's all I want to challenge you in. Because this language is the story of your salvation and what Christ has done for us. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might what? Present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Now, let me pause. Is that beautiful? It's beautiful. <sighs> to dominate your wife is to forget your salvation. The Bible says that the person in whom loves much has been forgiven much. They remember who they were and what Christ has saved them from. And our worship, our spiritual acts of worship, demonstrate the witness of what Christ has done for us. To do something else is to contaminate your witness. This is a love story like no other. That means that Christ loved us while we were still sinners. Hold on now. Josh, that means something else. That means that he wasn't just waiting around for the church to love him back. He chose to love even though the church would turn its back on him. He chose to love even when he wasn't being loved in return. I love what Vody Bauckham says. He was in a particular conference and he was talking about husbands loving their wives. And one of the things that we often overlook here is that it didn't say husbands be in love with your wives. Now, for some of you like, OK, well, what is I'm not saying that there shouldn't be passion there. But when passion is making the decisions then you are led by your desires to be happy. And if not happy, then this may not be the one for you. But the reality is, is that he didn't say, husbands, go home and be in love with your wife. He says, love them. <coughs> love them. And as Bodhi said, he had got somebody who had, in a session, was just like, well, she doesn't love me back. The love is missing. He said, well, it says to love your neighbor as yourself. 
Well, now he goes on to say, as the man was speaking to Vody, he said, well, we've left the house and, or she's left the house and we're arguing all the time. The Bible says, love your enemies. I love that correspondence because he got it. What we've done here in America and in Western thought is our happiness is number one. That's why some of us are divorced now. Because your happiness was number one. Well, I didn't say all now. I said some. So don't come up to me after service. <laughs> it's because we idolize happiness in the same way. Think about what I'm about to say. Didn't we preach on Micah? And wasn't it the false views of those in whom we're oppressing God's people? Wasn't it the false view of, well, since we're prospering, God is blessing us. So we start to equate our own happiness with God's blessing. So if I'm not happy-go-lucky and I'm not on fire for Patty every single day, there must be something wrong. And typically, we don't look at ourselves. We say that the other person has to change. For those who are living in a loveless, unhappy marriage, I want you to think about this for a moment. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. It should be on the screen. I just want to just speak this over your life. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. If you're in that right now, and... I think it was B.B. King, the thrill is gone. Don't give up. God is not unjust. He sees how you serve in the midst of conflict unto his glory. He sees it when no one else sees it. Now, let me preface this. It's 2022. I'm not talking about women. Stay there in an abusive situation. All right, I'm just hear me out. I'm talking about those where the thrill is gone. You continue to keep serving. God sees you. And I want to go back here to Ephesians. See, this responsibility that we have is rooted in Christ. And the fruit is evident in how it is that you exercise your headship. That's the fruit. It's how you exercise your headship. I mean, think about what he's saying. I'm not going to go through some exposition of Ephesians 5. I just want to touch on it because holding, your, holding God's hand while you're holding her heart, I think, epitomizes the whole thing. What he's saying in the scripture is love is satisfyingly submissive in Christ. The Bible says that he endured the cross because there was joy set before him. So this isn't just a situation in which you are in this relationship and you're just like, well, I have to do this. There was a willingness. There was a love because there was joy set before him because the reward was from God. He saw the joy. It meant that love is sacrificial. It's sacrificial. Man, I'll be honest with you. Ephesians 5 is terrifying. It's terrifying. It's not something to trump up. It's like, it's terrifying. This is terrifying language. Because each man, after it's like, yeah, Christ loved the church, and he died. He died. 
Yes, he rose again, but he died. But I think we get to the dying part, and it's like he went through humiliation. He was beaten. He was bruised for our iniquities. My goodness, falsely accused. And Paul is saying, love your wife as Christ loved the church. That's terrifying. But it is perfect, powerful, and such a blessing to the body of Christ. Because we saw the benefit of the crucifixion. We saw the benefit of the resurrection. So it's not just love is sacrificial and I'm just, oh, doing my husbandly duty to where I just devote my time in such a way where I just consider her interest. I'm not talking about false humility. I'm talking about daily dying. Die. Men, die. It, right now, you probably walked into church in a conflict. Maybe there was a disagreement before you came in that you've held on to all weekend. Husbands, die. Die. It's not worth it to continue to keep fighting just for domination and control's sake or the pride, like in my marriage, just to say you're right. And ruin my fellowship with my wife. Die. Die because that's what Christ did. But he didn't just do it. There was joy set before him that he was going to be raised again. We walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? We walk in the power, the unction of the Holy Spirit. Not the power and unction of holy men. Holy Spirit. That means he is giving you everything necessary to be a witness in your marriage. And that means when you don't have it figured out, I don't have it figured out, you die. Lord, fill me up with what I need to continue to cultivate a relationship that demonstrates the love that you showed us. It's not just sacrificial. The love is sanctifying, He's set apart. So we set the church apart for a holy purpose. And with the spirit continuing to dwell with us, there is continued cultivation that we conform to his likeness. Essentially, I'm going to make you more beautiful. So husbands, that's our job. Make your wife more beautiful. That doesn't mean go on there and start putting makeup on her. Make her more beautiful by how you exercise your headship. Just love is your own body. Nourish and cherish. Take care of your wife. Protect your wife. Women, I get it. I can protect myself, right? I hear that all the time. I don't need a man to protect me. I got it. You're tough. Okay, I get it. Now, on the other half, and I'm going to go back to this. Men, Jesus ain't looking for tough guys. He's looking for trustworthy guys. He's looking for faithful guys. Not hardened guys, but humble guys. He's not looking for soldiers. He's looking for servants. Don't get caught up in all of this manhood hysteria and become something that you were not meant to be. Be courageous, yes, but in the spirit. Now, let me go back. I pray you understand this for the rest of your life. It is to the glory of God that a man steps in front of his family and does whatever it takes to protect his family. Don't steal that opportunity from your husband. That is his God-given responsibility. To not do that is to go right back to the garden. Man, where are you? It's not that you can't protect yourself. You are strong. But it is to the glory of God that a man lay down his life for his wife. Nourish and cherish. When I think about cherish, I think about treasuring the wife. I think about 
how it is that we hold our wives in high esteem and we continue to show them affection. He says, as your own body. Now, come on, man. Some of us have let our body go. All right. Understand that now. But what God is what God is saying here in the scriptures. Oh, let's think about this for a second, because this is heavy. How I treat my body may be a reflection on how I treat my wife. If I'm undisciplined in my habits over here and I'm just consuming everything that Preston told me not to consume. (laughs) And if I'm not looking in the mirror. You get what I'm saying? That it could be a reflection of how you're even treating your wife. We cultivate men with affection. Kiss your wife. I should have got an amen. Amen. Hug your wife. Hold her hand. Walk with her. Listen to her. Be gentle in the way that you are with her. She's not you. You know that most of the sin in our marriages is that, man, we keep trying to make the wife into the man. Hold on, wives. You ain't, you ain't. And wives trying to make the man to the wife. That, that's next week. So anyway, <laughs> I want my son and my daughter to see affection in the home. Now, it may get you in trouble like it did me. My son, he sees me in affectionate holds with my wife. I'm going to keep the hands up here for right now. He sees me. uh, Come, I'm married now. (laughs) He sees me kissing her. He sees me hugging her. I'd rather hear my son say, ugh, than for my son to say, do you love mommy? I grew up in a household where I didn't see that. My mother, I mean, uh, my wife grew up in a family where there was no physical affection that was shown. It was like, well, what do y'all, what do you do? Because here it is. That doesn't look too appealing to me. If I'm a kid and you're telling me I need to get married, for what? To not show affection? So I told you it got me in trouble because then my son goes to school. So I was the one that had to explain, and he became a witness. Hey, uh, your son, a little touchy-feely today, started hugging all of these students and kissing some of them on the cheek. And I said, you know what? I said, uh, I apologize, I said, for, you know, who he was demonstrating this with. I said, but I'm not going to apologize for my wife and I being affectionate at home. And I said, he sees it all the time. And I said, so for him, he just said, oh, this is the way? Like, yeah. And then I had to sit him down like, hey, man, <laughs> they'll call the cops on you, brother. <laughs> you know, hey, for, for real. You know, what are the young people? For real, for real, right? And I had to, t- but I, he saw affection. Why? I love my body. I'm a nurturer. I'm a chair. It's, it's not this sleep in two bedrooms. They need to see reconciliation, not working relationships that you're dutified in because you've been married so long. Love your wife. Hmm. Hold her hand or hold his hand while you hold her heart. You know what's so awesome about this? Is at the end of the scripture, Paul says the mystery was so profound in the fact that the marriage was a foreshadowing of Christ's love for the church. He went back to creation and essentially saying that up until this time, we get a fuller revelation of what was really going on, and it was foreshadowing Christ's love for the church in saving us. So
so. That also means I have to forgive. Every time a man meets with me and it's gotten to that point where now the language of irreconcilable differences or there's been sin, a gross sin committed. I said, you have two choices. I said, because of your American citizenship and your heavenly citizenship. So you have two choices. One, if it is of sexual morality, you know what the Bible says. I said, that's your right. I said, but there's this other one. I said, because of your heavenly citizenship and because of the spirit of God that dwells within you. I said, you also have the right to forgive. And I said, this is the narrow path. This is the narrow gate. And the reality, ladies and gentlemen, is that most men have not been taught how to reconcile. That's why we leave. We haven't been taught how to reconcile. We've been told since day one, keep your emotions to yourself. Day one. And wives, I pray that you get it. For a man who's been told to share your weak, share your emotions as weakness, and now he gets married, and you're expecting him to share his emotions. It's like breaking a code for a man. But men, if you suffer like I do, go back to the garden. Oh, I'm not talking about in Eden. I'm talking about in Gethsemane. When Jesus grabbed three of the core, Peter, James, and John, please pray. And I'm going to go over here and pray because I'm hurting. And I'm going to share my emotions with the world to the point that you can even record my emotions and how I was feeling because I know, God, you will comfort me. Men, if you're hardened in your heart and it's hard for you to show emotions and to share emotions, connect that back to the garden and with humble knee, allow for yourself to demonstrate love in a way that you've never demonstrated before. So that when God calls out to you and says, man, man of God, where are you? We should answer back, Father, I'm holding your hand while I'm holding her heart. We hope you enjoyed today's message. To stream more of our past video sermons, please check out our YouTube channel or our website at endurancechurch.com. You can also learn more about our church, our various ministries, and how you can get involved. Again, our website is endurancechurch.com. We'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line anytime at info at endurancechurch.com. God bless you. And thanks for being part of our online service today.